Well, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first NAI Director Seminar of the new year. And this is going to be a particularly exciting topic because we're going to be hearing about a subsurface microbial community that lives under conditions that might very well obtain on other planets, particularly Mars, and we're going to hear a bit about that comparison. Our speakers today are two of our senior investigators, Principal Investigator Lisa Pratt and uh, Deputy P.I. T.C. Onstott uh, of the Indiana-Princeton-Tennessee team. Uh, Lisa is, uh, has degrees in both botany and geology from the University of North Carolina and Princeton, it turns out, which is where her PhD is from, as well as uh, a master's in botany from the University of Illinois. TC has degrees in geophysics and geology from Caltech and Princeton University. The title of their talk today is Radiolysis of Water as a Source of Bioavailable Energy in the Subsurface of Earth and Mars. And I turn it over to Lisa and TC. Welcome. Good. I guess we'll find out now how well the pickup is working on this polycom. Is this uh, loud enough for everybody to hear? We hear you loud and clear. Wonderful. Well, we're going to uh, try something a little different today from the other director's seminars. We're going to try tag team presentation. So... Uh, Every uh, 10 or 15 slides, we'll, we'll switch speakers and move back and forth so you hear from both of us, although we've, uh, we've uh, interleaved everything into what is hopefully one coherent presentation. So I think we can just uh, uh, flip by the first, uh, the first slide, which we've, uh, we've already had introduced. And we thought we'd start by reminding you that this project actually uh, started prior to um, our submission of a proposal to the uh, NAI Institute. Uh, this project was actually initially funded by a, a program at NSF that no longer is ex in existence, and that was the Lexan program. Um, and, and really, it was a, a very exciting time when uh, Tullis pulled together a group of collaborators um, from a number of uh, uh, universities and institutes and, and convinced a group of people to uh, uh, go underground in South Africa and use the infrastructure of these deep and ultra-deep gold mines as a window into the deep earth, taking advantage of the fact that uh, under circumstances when they are, are doing exploration, they have these water intersections. Some of them are, are quite high pressure. The high pressure flushes the borehole and prevents uh, contaminants in the mine from moving into that groundwater. So if you can get a team of scientists on site, while the water is still um, coming out under high pressure, you have an opportunity to sample um, sequestered microbial communities deep below the surface of the earth. And so um, that was a project that uh, I guess had a, about a three and a half, four year lifeline. Is that right, Tullus? Yes, that's right. And um, it, w it, it didn't just involve senior people. I think it's important right from the beginning to say that, th that there have been more than, uh, more than 20 postdocs and Ph.D. graduate students at institutions across the United States and at a number of schools in Canada who were the ones that spent uh, many, many months uh, living uh, at a house that we rented in South Africa and being available day and night so that if one of the collaborating minds phoned up and said there's a water intersection, we could get a group of people on site very, very quickly. They could take samples, um, bring the samples back to a laboratory that we had constructed in the garage of that house, and those samples could be uh, immediately put into um, a, an anaerobic glove bag, a koi chamber, and then sampled for um, microbiology. The idea behind um, that initial study was really to demonstrate whether or not there were microbial communities um, in these deep and, as it turned out, quite ancient groundwaters. We subsequently then proposed a continuation of this research moving into the Arctic, which um, seemed to be a, a better analog for life on other planets and icy moons. And that, that was the project that became the IPTI, the Indiana Princeton Tennessee Astrobiology um, Collaboration. And, and that, the idea there was to, again, 
use the infrastructure of mines to get into the subsurface and to look at uh, groundwater microbial ecosystems that had been sequestered from contact with the surface for um, thousands to millions of years and to take what we learned with those kinds of samples and uh, use it to inform us about what kinds of instruments might be suitable for landed missions uh, to Mars as a way of thinking about life detection uh, within the permafrost and uh, in brines below the permafrost. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about three aspects of that research. First, um, the work that was done in the deep and uh, ultra-deep South African gold mines. Then to talk about the work that uh, has been done at Lupin Mine in the Canadian Arctic. And finally, to end with a little update on where we are with the uh, scientific borehole at High Lake in the Arctic. So we'll, we'll start with South Africa. Um, I'll introduce a little bit about the overall geology. And then TC will talk about the microbiology of the sample. So here's a, a simplified geologic map of... Um, of the, of the South African uh, Whitwaters Rand Basin. You can see it here. It's a relatively undeformed basin for, for an ancient basin. And you can see that the gold deposits here shown by this yellow gold fields color are primarily located around um, the margin of the basin at the contact between the Central Rand Group and the West Rand Group. There are a number of mines um, that have been operated for a long period of time. Uh, decades, and many of these uh, older mines now extend as deep as four kilometers below the surface, although most of the mining activity is between um, two and 3.5 kilometers. So you can, you can see from this photograph, which was taken at the Evander mine, that the access to these underground um, excavations is really little changed from the 1800s. There's a head frame, there's a flywheel, there's a cable, there's a steel box. You step into the steel box. Somebody releases the brake on the cable, and you uh, you you drop at, uh, at 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 40 to 60 kilometers an hour into the subsurface. Um, interestingly enough, it, really the cage is the only part of the trip that's um, particularly uncomfortable because they uh, they jam you into the box like sardines, um, and the scientists really only have access to the mines as part of the cruise shift. So we go we go in and out with uh, with the miners. Um, when you step out underground, there's really, other than the fact that it's uh, cozy and warm and humid, there's not... Dark. There, dark, yes. Smelly. <laughs> oh, smelly, yeah, there would be that. But it's, it's really not a particularly unpleasant place to be, and you, you then hike to where these water intersections are and uh, go about your business of collecting samples. Um, again, uh, the, the people who, who work there full-time are um, are working in some of the tight spaces and the, the, the crease, so-called for the fact that they don't open it up very wide, uh, where the excavations are extended right up to the ore body. And you see here a group of miners um, right, at the, right at the active face. And you'll, you'll notice that they're, uh, they're, they're, they're seated. And uh, behind the shoulder of the guy on the left side, you can see a stack of wooden logs. And those wooden log stacks are the only thing that hold open the crease during mining activities. And although some of our samples were up in these tight places, for the most part, the areas where we sampled were areas where the, um, the tunnels or the drives had been opened up to a, to a slightly larger area. So for the most part, we were, we were able to uh, work in a comfortable uh, standing position. The idea behind what we did, as I mentioned a minute ago, is we took advantage of water intersections during uh, primarily exploration activities, although sometimes we went to sites of, of historic water intersections where the mines had continued to be unable to control the flow of water into the mines. So in many cases, these were parts of the mines they were getting ready to abandon, and, and we would be uh, allowed in, uh, you know, often under rather unpleasant circumstances because hot water was building up on the floor of the mine. Most of these water intersections are quite gassy. Um, the dissolved gases are often ones you don't want to breathe, like methane and carbon monoxide and hydrogen sulfide and hydrogen. Yes, and that. and uh, ammonia. Uh, yeah, ammonia, you name it. Uh, not, not a blend that you really want to be inhaling with any regularity. So uh, the trick was to work very closely with the mine owners to ensure that they could ventilate these, uh, these areas where uh, waters were coming in um, and ventilate them enough that we could safely breathe the air, that we could 
keep the level of methane well below the explosive limit um, and where we could stay cool enough that we could function for more than uh, more, for more than a few minutes. So you're looking here at a, a particular um, installation of cartridges that uh, that uh, a group of us did um, at a site that was 3.2 kilometers below the surface. Those are Tullus's hands in the upper photograph, loading the cartridges, getting ready to put them into an autoclave. Then down at the bottom um, is uh, is what I would, what I look like when I'm uh, working in a room that's 120 degrees C. Um, and most yeah. of yeah, not not C. Pardon me. We did not uh, we did not <laughs> did not break the laws of nature. No, this was that was Fahrenheit. That was uh, it was a very warm place. We uh, we found that we could be on site for 15 to 20 minutes before we started to get uh, impossibly clumsy. We'd hike back out to a cooler site and go back in. But you can see uh, over my shoulder one of the cartridges that Tullus was, uh, Tullus was loading up here. So there are the cartridges, and now you can see it installed right here with a set of blowout valves and uh, some flow meters. We did the installation. We left it for several days, and we went back and harvested the filters, read the flow meter to see how much, how much water had moved through the filters. Therefore, when we, when we open these up and measure the amount of biomass on them, we can then quantify the biomass per liter of filtered water. The types of waters that we were filtering in these mines varied from, uh, from fresh to brackish and in some cases quite saline. Um, you can see a wide, wide range of values here. These are the mines where we took the majority of our, of our samples. Um, An impening mine, of course, is the, the mine where the sample that was uh, recently uh, described in the, the paper in Science, that's where that sample came from. And you can see that was a, a, a quite brackish sample compared to the full range of what's available in these mines. So I'm now going to turn it over to Tullus to talk about um, talk about not only the, uh, the the microbiology described in the science paper, but to also talk about uh, the work that's been done since then since then uh, on these samples. Right. So one of the things that we noticed when we were characterizing the phylogeny of the different microbial filters from these different sites was that the deeper we went, uh, the lower that diversity. We were seeing archaea like methanogens and proteobacteria in the shallower sites, but as we went deeper, hotter, more saline, and more ancient fracture fluids, and these were at depths greater than about two kilometers, temperatures greater than about 45 degrees C, we saw the diversity narrow to uh, a phyla a bacteria known as gram-positive bacteria or the firmicutes. And in particular, across the entire basin, we started seeing one organism, uh, which appeared to be a sulfate-reducing type of organism based upon the, the phylogenetic assignment. That was present and even in many cases predominant in the clone, what we call the clone library, how we're characterizing the diversity of the bacteria in these environments. Now, uh, one of the advantages of being able to filter thousands of liters, in some cases tens of thousands of liters of water, is that you can accrue enough mass on the filter that you can then do a, a metagenomic analysis. And in this case, it was essential because after several years of attempting to enrich and isolate this organism, we had failed, basically, using different types of media. So what uh, we could do under the IPTI collaboration is avail ourselves of the facilities um, that were present in uh, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory through the um, supervision of Terry Hazen there and uh, Adam Arkin's group as well to do uh, a metagenomic analysis. The sequencing was performed by the Joint Genomics Institute and various uh, extraction procedures were developed by the Pacific Northwest National Lab. This was applied to one uh, borehole in particular at Impening Mine, which was uh, fairly hot. Um, and it was intersected at 2.8 kilometers, but in fact uh, it was probably appearing from about 4 kilometers based upon the hydrogen isotope analyses. Uh, when it's in uh, isotopic equilibrium with the water it provides a temperature estimate. 
it's a uh, fairly alkaline uh, water, about pH 9.3, which is important. And that is, again, fairly typical of these deepest waters. There's methane in this water as, as well as uh, low uh, carbon number hydrocarbons. And the isotopic analysis performed at Barbara Sherwood Lawler's lab in University of Toronto indicates that it's an abiogenic methane source, not a methanogenic methane, but uh, abiogenically generated hydrocarbons, which is something that we typically encountered at the deepest levels in South Africa. The bulk age of the water varied from 15 to 25 million years, depending upon what isotopic system you're using to date these waters. Uh, we are looking at a helium to xenon radiogenic ages, and this was performed by our colleague uh, Joanna Lippmann, uh, who is now at uh, the GFC in Potsdam, Germany. The predominant electron donor in the system, as was many oftentimes the case in South Africa at the deepest levels, was hydrogen, very high levels. And the predominant electron acceptor, again, is sulfate, which was quite common when we got to the deepest levels in South Africa. Um, the isotopic analyses performed by LISA indicated that it was fractionated in a way that was consistent with microbial sulfate reduction. And this is the environment uh, which, again, was dominated by our uh, what we had called the disulfophotomaculum-like organism, DLO. It uh, dominated 94% of the clone library um, that was present in this particular borehole. Uh, its closest environmental clone was uh, actually discovered by uh, James Cohen in a seafloor event. So it bears uh, at least a phylogenetic relationship, some similarities to what has been found in, in old ocean floor uh, rocks. Now, with a cell density of, of 10 to the 8th per liter, and we essentially filtered 5,000 liters, we were able to get up to you know, 10 to the 12th in terms of some number of cells. We completed the genomic analysis. We were able to actually uh, close the, gene, the genome for this organism and uh, are able to assign various attributes to it. We've uh, given it a candidate name of Disulfurutus odaxviator, which is species name is based upon the note that was written by Arnold, Sor uh, Arnold Sacknussen to the, uh, the party that descended into the crater in Iceland uh, on the journey to the center of the earth, uh, Jules Verne's novel. Uh, the Disulfurutus comes from Latin for the rod-like morphology of this uh, creature and obviously its capacity to reduce sulfate. This is a depiction of the organism, a cartoon-like depiction of all of its uh, potential capabilities based upon the genome analysis. It has about, uh, let's see what I got here, a description here. Nope, okay. It has about 2.4 megabase pairs and about 2,200 uh, protein coding genomes present in it. Um, it's obviously too complicated to go through all of these, but the bottom line here is that the organism is not streamlined in any way. It actually carries a very uh, uh, metabolically plastic genome. It's capable both of substrate level phosphorylation, so it can, it can um, live upon a substrate of sugars or aromatic hydrocarbons, but if those are not present, it can also utilize an acetyl coenzyme A system to live off of hydrogen CO2 or carbon monoxide and produce acetate as well. In fact, it has two types of acetyl coenzyme A's, one of which appears to be a transplant from an archaea organism that utilizes formate uh, in its system, which is interesting in itself. It's uh, capable of fixing nitrogen through a, a NIF-BEH system, or it can utilize ammonia as well. It has hydrogenases, three different types of hydrogenases, in fact, and so that makes sense in terms of hydrogen as an electron donor. And it has an electron transport chain, which is uh, strictly for sulfate reduction. It has the sodium sulfate transporter systems as well as a variety of sodium proton antiporters present, as well as a sodium ATPA system. And so uh, these attributes, um, the ATP, direct ATP production by sulfate reduction and phosphorylation plus the antiporters, means that it has the ability to work well in a high pH environment 
even without, uh, if it were not able to maintain a, a proton gradient. The other thing that's interesting about it is that it has chemoreceptors and flagella uh, machinery. So it is, appears to be chemotactic. Uh, as to why it's chemotactic or what, uh, uh, what that endows it with or uh, what properties um, that gives it that uh, chemotaxis provides is not entirely clear at this moment. I want to describe the little photomicrograph? Oh yes, the, in the right hand, uh, the um, in the lower right hand corner is the SEM image of the filter itself, which shows the the uh, the shape and the size of the bacterium on the on the filter there. Now, um, from an evolutionary point of view, it's kind of interesting um, where this organism lies. As I mentioned earlier, it's in the Firmicutes. This is a microbial tree that was published last year by Cicerelli, and it's based upon 31. Uh, orthologous genes that are associated with ribosomes and has been corrected for horizontal gene transfer. So in this particular diagram you'll see the big lavender colored domain there represents all the bacteria. The pinkish colored domain that's in the northeastern corner um, yeah, right over here that, yeah. are the eukaryotes and these are the uh, archaea over here. So most of the genome sequences here represented in this diagram are for bacteria. And this is based upon complete genomes that had been published at the time of this article. Uh, now we're going to focus on the region where our organism lies, which is right down here. It's in the deepest root or the deepest branch of the bacterial domain. Let me blow that up a little bit, and you'll see that if we uh, look at in red here the branches that are going from the shortest branch in the archaea domain, which is uh, Pyrococcus abyssi, which turns out is present in the South African subsurface, over to where most of our firmicutes lie in the deepest parts of South Africa. They lie on this short branch here, very close to uh, Thermal Anaerobacter Tancong genus, as well as in between over here, Clostridium perfrigens. Now, when you look at the subsurface, the continental subsurface across the planet, we frequently encounter firmicutes that lie in this little cluster right over here. And where does our desulfurutus odoxiviator occur? This is just uh, when you look at the more recent compilation um, of complete sequence genomes, and this is a protein tree here. That's why you're showing like amino acid identity here. Here's the deepest uh, rooted in the previous tree, and here's our desulfurutus odoxiviator, along with the clostridium perfringens over here. So it seems to indicate that the organism is not only a diverse uh, Metabolically, metabolically plastic, it also is, uh, appears to be an ancient lineage. And it could be that these deep subsurface environments are in fact providing an environment that is somewhat representative of the early Earth, perhaps preserving that environment, and therefore selectively preserving or enriching for these ancient organisms. There are several other things present in this organism. It's capable of sporulation germination, and like its close relative Morella thermocytica, this may provide a thermal tolerance mechanism for it, as well as heat shock proteins and pilus form of machinery. Now, it's a planktonic organism, and what we don't know, uh, because we are working with filtered water samples, is uh, how abundant is it present on the rock surfaces itself. And the pilus forming machinery are important in that regard. The other interesting aspect about it is that it uh, has a dearth of oxyoreductase genes. So essentially, a lot of the oxygen tolerance genes that are present in other sulfate reducing bacteria, including Morella thermocytica, which is not a sulfate-producing organism, but it's a close relative, are absent in Desulfurutus odoxiviator, which suggests that it has been in uh, an obligate anaerobic environment for quite a long time. The most important question, however, is uh, why sulfate? It's in a very deep isolated environment. It's obviously chosen sulfate as its principal electron acceptor. Where is the sulfate coming from in this environment? And why isn't it depleted? And I'll turn the answer to that question over to Lisa. <laughs> and so here we are uh, switching up again just to keep you on your toes. It, it really was a perplexing question because uh, normally when we see uh, sulfate brines, we think in terms of either some sort of an evaporatively concentrated marine water or some sort of a, a saline alkaline lake. Or, or perhaps uh, there, there are evaporites in the section that have uh, 
been dissolved by the by the groundwater. But in the case of these deep South African locations, um, none of those appeared likely. None of those uh, options even appeared reasonable. And uh, we began to be quite concerned that, that we did not have an identifiable source of sulfate uh, to sustain the metabolism of these organisms. What we did have, though, was a great deal of pyrite um, in the section. And because these are very ancient uh, sandstones and conglomerates, it also had a significant amount of detrital uraninite. And we began to wonder if there was some, uh, some potential coupling between uh, the radioactivity from the uraninite grains and the pyrite grains. And so um, because we, we, had, uh, we had a lot of stable sulfur isotopic data on the coexisting sulfate and sulfide, we started to also look at the isotopic composition of the pyrite, and we began to do a series of sealed tube experiments to, to look at the reaction or the potential reactions between uh, the products that result from radiolysis of water, meaning the splitting of a water molecule by um, ionizing radiation from um, radioactive materials. And, and that also required us to uh, educate ourselves about the radiolysis of water, which is a chemistry very few of us are introduced to in either college or graduate school. It just isn't something that we've routinely taught as part of the standard uh, you know, natural geochemistry of our planet. So here are three quick slides that will um, give, you, give you a little bit of a feeling for how these uh, reaction pathways work. Uh, there's a very, uh, very complex and rapid set of initial reactions um, after there is a track created by um, release of radioactive energy. These initial species, which last uh, only 10 to the minus tenths to 10 to the minus eight second, they further react to produce the species listed down below. You'll notice that, that very quickly, if the water, if the fragments of the water molecule do not recombine to make a stable water molecule, you very quickly generate um, molecular hydrogen and then a, a whole complex soup of reactive oxidizing species uh, such as the one listed above up there. These short-lived reactive uh, species then uh, recombine and react with one another to begin to develop more stable species and, and those are in place within about 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 3rd second. And what you end up with um, that then is stable long enough to move out from the site of the initial uh, radiolysis are oxidants like hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radicals, and reductants like hydrogen ions and molecular hydrogen. What people have found through the years in studying radiolysis as a process um, doing long-term damage inside nuclear reactors is that with continuous um, laboratory irradiation, you eventually reach steady state concentrations for um, molecular hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide, and you do, um, under these laboratory conditions, get small amounts of molecular oxygen. So we, again, uh, began to think about experiments in which we could um, look at, at hydrogen peroxide uh, both in natural systems and look at it in laboratory reactions under much more controlled conditions. So we also started um, revisiting the literature. There is actually quite a substantial literature from uh, the former Soviet Union describing the importance of hydrogen peroxide in natural settings associated with uranium deposits. Very little of that literature was ever translated um, into, uh, into other languages, with the notable exception of a number of pieces of research by Volk that were translated and are available through the uh, IAEA in, in Vienna. And it seems that uh, uh, the Russians were, were really well aware of both the importance of hydrogen peroxide in reactors as well as the importance in natural groundwaters down, uh, down flow from uranium ore bodies. In addition, um, in a number of places, people have started reporting the presence of, of peroxide-containing minerals, like the one shown here that was described for the first time in 2003. Um, other uh, important examples, it, it's certainly been, um, it's been described as an important catalytic component in uh, atmospheric chemistry on Earth. It's, it's also detected and, uh, and inferred in the Martian atmosphere. And many people have talked about it as one of the, uh, the, the aggressive oxidizing species that might be uh, sequestered on the surface of 
of minerals on uh, in the Martian regolith. So again, uh, once once we became aware of the importance, the potential importance of, of these pathways, it turned out we certainly uh, we certainly weren't discovering this for the first time. There were many other people that had worked on this, and there's really quite a quite an extensive literature. So the kinds of experiments um, that were initiated uh, by myself and Ed Ripley working with a, uh, a wonderful uh, postdoctoral scientist, Liliana Leftakariu, who is just, uh, just this semester joined the faculty at Southern Illinois University, uh, are illust illustrated in this, uh, in this figure right here. What you see are a series of, of uh, sealed uh, quartz glass tubes, uh, and the experiments that we did ran from 4 degrees to 150 degrees centigrade. And what we did is we uh, very aggressively deoxygenated water, uh, aliquoted in millimolar level solutions of hydrogen peroxide, and then um, put sealed into those tubes a small amount of very carefully prepared pyrite um, of a uniform, very fine grain size, which you see sitting here in the bottom of the tube on the left. And you'll notice that. Um, at these reactions over a, a very, you know, a, a, a relatively mild temperature range, very interesting set of, of temperatures for biology, we see marked differences in the appearance of the tubes, and, and those are really the, the products of the reaction between hydrogen peroxide and pyrite, again, in very pure deoxygenated water. And what we see is around 50 degrees C, we begin to see a, a visible change in the color of the pyrite. This is also around 60 to 70 degrees C is where hydrogen peroxide um, begins to decompose. Over here, as we get around 100 degrees C, we start to see considerable elemental sulfur. We also see a drape of, of hematite and other um, oxidized iron minerals developing on the wall of the tube. And by the time we're up here at 150 degrees C, we see uh, extensive evidence of um, Fe3 minerals, uh, quite a diverse and complex mineralogy. If we also look at the surface of those samples, we see that the, the freshly prepared pyrite that's loaded into the tubes has a very smooth surface in comparison to this um, deeply pitted surface of the pyrite that results from these reactions with hydrogen peroxide. When we took the, the residues and looked at them with x-ray diffraction, uh, thanks to the help of David Bish here at uh, Indiana, we found, again, quite a complex mineralogy. Now, there are three superimposed x-ray diffraction traces here, one in black, which is the starting pyrite, one in green, which is a reaction uh, with 0 0.02 molar solutions, and then one in red, which is a reaction with a 0 0.2 uh, molar hydrogen peroxide solution. And you can simply, down here, we haven't uh, shown you the identification of every peak, but these are the major products that result from that reaction. Um, a number of, of iron sulfates, hydrated iron sulfates, and of course, as I mentioned before, we also get a number of oxides and hydroxides. Perhaps most interesting for this audience is the fact that uh, um, hydronium jerosite was one of the common products that we found in these reactions utilizing just um, hydrogen peroxide and pyrite. We also looked um, extensively at the rates of sulfate production in order to, to try to begin to estimate if radiolysis was an important process in the Witwatersrand Basin, and if hydrogen peroxide was the dominant stable product, what kinds of yields could we anticipate over geologically interesting periods of time, like tens of millions of years to, um, to longer periods of time? And again, um, one of the things that we monitored in addition to the fate of the sulfur is we were very interested in the source of the oxygen to form these, uh, to form these sulfate ions. And, and we, we have a manuscript that's um, just about to be submitted on the oxygen isotopic composition as well as the sulfur isotopic composition of sulfate that is produced in these reactions. And you can see here we took advantage of the fact that we could do a, a, simple, um, a, a simple isotope test utilizing water with an isotopic, starting isotopic value of around negative 10, 
and markedly contrasting hydrogen peroxide with an oxygen isotopic value of close to 50. And by simply having those as the only two sources of oxygen in the system, we could then use the isotopic composition of the oxygen in the product sulfate to tell us whether or not and in what proportion oxygen was being drawn from hydrogen peroxide versus water. What you see quite interestingly is this marked depression in the isotopic composition of product sulfate, uh, again, right around the temperature when the color in those reaction tubes changes from, um, from unpigmented to very brightly colored yellows, oranges, and reds. So that's really um, where the research went, driven, driven by the samples that we had taken in South Africa. As we moved into a permafrost environment, um, we identified a number of mine localities, both, both mines that were just getting started and were largely um, surface active mines, to mines like Lupin, which are historical mines with a deep uh, subsurface infrastructure. You can see both Lupin Mine with the X and then High Lake, which is the location of the property where we um, where we drilled a, a scientific borehole through the permafrost last year to intersect subpermafrost brines. We'll talk, uh, we'll f talk first about the research at Lupin, then we'll talk about the drilling activities at High Lake. I'll introduce Lupin, and then uh, as we did with South Africa, I'll turn it over to Tullus to talk about the, the microbiology work that's been done. This is what Lupin looks like as you approach from the air. Um, in early fall, there's already a pretty good snow cover. You can see that Lupin is on the, the margin of a, of a large lake, which here in the early fall um, is not, not yet ice covered, but it will be soon. Lupin's a very, a very wonderful place for scientists to work because it's easy to get in and out. Um, there's a large runway. Um, there's, a very nice, uh, there's a very nice weather station and air control tower. So even though the mine itself has been now shut down because of the, uh, the, the depth of their ore body and its de decreasing grade, it, uh, this structure is going to be maintained for the foreseeable future as a, um, as a fuel depot and as a, um, as a landing strip that can util be utilized by smaller mines that are just starting to be developed in the area. The project that, that turned out to provide a wonderful opportunity for us was a project that had been in existence for four or five years prior to our arrival at Lupin. That was a project simply called Permafrost at Lupin. It was an international collaboration to look at the fate of groundwater and model the fate of groundwater associated um, with permafrost localities that were susceptible to being covered by continental glaciers. And it was funded by a collaboration of organizations in um, in high northern Europe as well as uh, Canada, and you can see the funding agencies there. What we did is um, we found out that there was a wonderful set of scientific boreholes that had been drilled at Lupin Mine as a collaboration between uh, investigators at the University of Waterloo and the Geological Survey of Finland. Um, they had been looking at the inorganic chemistry of these, uh, this borehole array. We came in and, and had the wonderful opportunity to um, hook onto those boreholes, uh, filter water, and collect biomass. The permafrost at Lupin is a little more than 500 meters in depth. You can see the temperature profile here, and Tullus will uh, touch again on this problem of these very cold temperatures near the, near the top of the permafrost, which turned out to plague us a little bit um, in, in the borehole project. We'll get back to that in a minute. Here you can see uh, typical total dissolved solids for the groundwaters at Lupin, not nearly as deep as the groundwaters uh, that we studied in the Witz Water Rand. These samples are all taken um, from 1,100 meters below the surface, a little more than a kilometer, up to about 800 uh, meters below the surface. And I'm going to turn it over now to tell us to talk about uh, the microbiological work that's been done both by his graduate students and a number of other collaborators. Right, so one of the questions that we had walking into this site, which was quite well characterized in terms of understanding the origin of the water, was whether or not we might find similarities between the microbial, subsurface microbial ecosystem present beneath the permafrost and what we had previously reported on in South Africa. And we worked with uh, Kareem Bakermans from the Michigan State University group who were experts in culturing psychophilic organisms. 
These are results from the filtered water samples from Lubin Mine. And what you're seeing plotted here is the number of plate counts. This is on an auger medium versus temperature. And she can easily demonstrate that what we are seeing in the environment in terms of what organisms we could enrich from the environment are truly psychotolerant organisms. In other words, their optimum growth exists at sub-25 degrees centigrade, and then they peter off once you go to higher temperatures there. But they're still growing very, very nicely at zero degrees centigrade. What are some of these organisms? Well, they're microaerophilic to aerobic organisms. Many of them actually belong to Pseudomonas. Some of them are nitrate reducers. We also did anaerobic enrichments. And in a sulfate-reducing culture, we were able to isolate a clostridium. Um, and when you look at the filters and just go ahead and build clone libraries of 16S RDNA without culturing, straight from the filters, you find out that, in fact, the microbial ecosystem is dominated by sulfate and sulfur-reducing bacteria and present also are a minor constituent of sulfide oxidizing bacteria that are utilizing nitrate reduction as the electron accepting process. So we seem to have evidence here of um, a different type of subsurface sulfuretum. In this case, instead of coupling it to radiolysis, we have essentially 16S evidence to suggest that it could be coupled through nitrate reduction and the reduction of ferric iron. Um, these are some what the cells look like from um, Bruno Salfantini at University of Rhode Island, who also participated in the field exercise. When you look at the 16S clone libraries, the dominant component turns out to be a disulfosporosinus. This is another organism, sulfate reducer, that belongs to the firmicutes and belongs to the same deep clade that we reported about in South Africa, here close to Clostridium perfringens. It um, is known to reduce sulfate to sulfide and can also grow homoacetogenically, uh, just as we reported for Desulfurutus audaxviator. Um, and it can switch to autotrophy in that regard. The uh, candidate for sulfide oxidation is a halothiobacillus organism. It's known to oxidize sulfide as well as sulfur intermediates like thiosulfate, sulfur, and tetrathionate. And it belongs to the uh, gamma proteobacteria. It's a chemolithotroph, so it can fix carbon as well. Um, it was once thought to be an oblig obligate aerobe, but it has been showing up more frequently in recent reports in anaerobic environments as well. Now, um, the presence of these proteobacteria and the firmicutes uh, raised a question. It could be that we're seeing mixing between, say, 25,000-year-old water, and that's why we're still seeing a community of nitrate and iron reducers. Or, there, of course, there was the prospect of that the long-term mining activities at Lupin had managed to contaminate the fractures. So one of the motivations for moving north to High Lake was to move to a region which had not seen any mining activity at all and drill a pristine borehole into the subpermafrost sub brines there. And the drill site selected in this case was High Lake because it was an active exploration site. There we had a massive sulfide, a copper zinc sulfide deposit that expressed itself easily from satellite photographs by these surficial Dawson deposits, which are a natural form of acid drainage. You could easily see them from space because of the orange-yellowish um, deposits that it, uh, would occurred on the surface. There, the permafrost was uh, 400 meters thick and was located within an Archean Age mafic volcanic belt. And so in many respects, from a geological perspective, it's very similar to Lupin, very similar to South Africa. Uh, this is looking from the drill site itself towards the southeast, and this big orange uh, stain that you're seeing here represents one of the Gossen deposits. So there's a, a belt of sulfides that runs underneath it. The Gossen deposits themselves descend about only a meter thick. So they're in the active zone before you reach the permafrost. Once you reach the permafrost, the Gossens go away. This is the drill itself that we use, exploration rig, triple core barrel. You're looking towards the northeast now. There's the mining camp. There's High Lake. 
And over to the left-hand side is the core laboratory that uh, we use to process the cores. And just stepping back a second, it's an angled borehole. Uh, from the drill site looking towards the southeast, we're actually looking at the horizontal projection of the drilling beneath the subsurface. So 400 meters, meters beneath the Gaussian deposit is our borehole. Okay, and just to show you the sequence of events there, the borehole had already been extended to about the middle of the permafrost zone, and we extended it further. Once we reached about 485 meters depth, we uh, pulled the drill rods along with all the drill water. The base of the permafrost at that was uh, 400 meters to 430 meters depth. We immediately dropped casing to about 290 meters, and the idea there was to protect the borehole from any melting permafrost. We didn't want the borehole to seal shut with ice. That was our primary concern. So by casing through the active zone and well into the permafrost zone, it prevented any water from freezing in the borehole. We removed about 400 liters of water by bailing, and that dropped the temperature from about 8 degrees C at the bottom of the borehole to 3 degrees C, and the salinity increased in the bottom of the borehole from 30 to 6,000 ppm. So we seem to see an inflush of brackish water into the bottom of that borehole as we monitored it. Then within about 24 hours, an ice plug formed at 125 meters, which trapped our sensors down the hole. That's where the borehole is about minus 6 degrees centigrade. And the reason why the ice plug formed is because of moist air during the daytime was descending down the hole and trapping into the borehole at the top. So you essentially have a cold trap here. And unless you cap that borehole and keep it capped at all times, you'll form an ice plug very, very quickly in the system. At uh, the last measurement, the water table was at 446 and was increasing at about one liter per hour before the sensor uh, was pulled and broken. Cores were processed in the anaerobic glove bag on site. Uh, we collected samples for tracer analysis. We used a perfluorocarbon tracer during the drilling process. And we used microspheres, fluorescent microspheres. Uh, we also collected core samples for gas analyses that we stored in vacuum canisters that we evacuated on site. We also collected samples for geophysical analyses by Steve Clifford down at LPI, who's part of our team. We froze samples on site, believe it or not, with dry ice <laughs> <laughs> that we flew up every time a flight came up uh, for DNA and lipid analyses. We refrigerated samples on site for electrochemical analyses, radio stable isotope tracer measurements. Yes? I might say we're, we're quite quite famous with the uh, supply people up there yes. for being the crazy scientists that uh, pay large sums of money to fly dry ice into the Arctic. That's right. Lots of gas cylinders, high-pressure gas cylinders went up as well. And this represents our first set of results that came from a, a technique called uh, phosphor imaging. What we were doing is we were taking the cores and adding a tiny bit of sulfate, radioactive sulfate, to a freshly broken fracture surface and then incubating them at 4 degrees centigrade. And then you let them incubate for 120 days, or about three months. You then pull them out of the refrigerator. This is all done anaerobically, of course. And you expose the silver foil to a phosphor image screen. And everywhere you see a tiny black dot represents radioactive 35 sulfur silver sulfide that's been deposited on the film, presumably from local hot spots of of uh, anaerobic sulfate reduction occurring. You notice that in most cases the outside surfaces of the cores are clean. And um, that probably is a credit to our incredibly uh, stringent uh, <laughs> realm of drilling as well as the fact that uh, in the process of doing these cores I UV irradiated the outside surface before I started the experiment to make sure that no contaminants would bugger up the results. So we're beginning to see some signs that again uh, a sulfate reduction community could be present in the system, and uh, the future analyses would tell us what its phylogenetic origin is, as well as whether or not it represents the dominant constituent, and then we have to get back to the origin of the sulfate again in this system. All right, and that brings us towards the end here. I think what we've been finding here is that uh, sulfate is a principal electron acceptor in these deep subsurface systems, which is something that we didn't necessarily anticipate in walking into it. In the case of South Africa, it's clear that radiolysis is the source of the sulfate as well as the source of the hydrogen gas we're seeing down there. 
and could be the source of several other key trace nutrients in that system that are sustaining these organisms uh, over a period of millions of years. And you can extrapolate that straight to Mars. In the case of lupin, a radiolysis may be playing a role, but we see biological evidence that suggests that, again, a sulfur cycle is present there, uh, but perhaps in this case, coupled to the reduction of nitrate and f ferric iron, not ferrous iron, but ferric iron in that case as well. Um, it remains to be seen, uh, in, the, in the case of the subpermafrost zones, whether or not we will find methanogens. We have not detected methanogens yet in that environment, although they were present in South Africa. And of course, methanogens is something of great interest to us because of the presence of methane as a trace gas in the atmosphere of Mars. Lisa, do you want to say anything else? No, I think we can stop there and open it up to questions. Uh, the only other thing I might add in closing is that uh, not only does this have in interesting consequences that Tullus has just mentioned for um, life on planets where um, life is forced into the subsurface by harsh surface conditions, but it mo might also inform us about uh, about Earth early on when the, the, the flux from radioactive decay was much higher than it is in the present day. Um, and, and also thinking about, uh, again, uh, protecting life in the subsurface during, uh, during periods of particularly active bombardment. We really um, have not thought very much about uh, the subsurface environment um, in terms of being oxidized by radiolysis. And I think uh, there's going to be a very exciting time ahead of us as uh, microbiologists and geochemists go out to look at these natural waters associated with uranium ore bodies and begin to rethink about oh, particularly um, geological features like roll front deposits in terms of not just uh, abiotic chemistry but potentially as, the, uh, as the, the fingerprint of complex microbial communities. So we're, we're, we're done, done talking now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lisa and TC. That was great. I think I'll start off with a question, and then we'll uh, turn it open to uh, everyone on the net for questions. Is there uh, anything that you could say about the source of the sulfate at High Lake? That is, is it? Uh, can you say anything about whether it's being uh, generated, as it is in South Africa, perhaps by radiolysis, or whether you've got more of a sulfur cycle? Uh, at High Lake, and also how long has the water you're sampling at High Lake likely been isolated from the uh, surface? Uh, I guess based upon our experience, our one experience that we encountered at Lupin, the formation of the permafrost may have occurred relatively recently, recently i.e. being in the period of the last 25,000 years. So there may have been a time uh, prior to that or m intermittently between glaciations when fresh water could have mixed with these uh, deep Canadian brines and may have colonized the environment over that period of time. As for the origin of the sulfate, which is a separate question, I don't think we have any strong constraints yet, although actually Lisa may have some evidence uh, that's starting to place some constraints on the origin of sulfate in the, in the system. We're, we're just completing a study in which we're comparing the isotopic composition of coexisting sulfate and sulfide in the water with coexisting sulfate and sulfide in quartz and calcite veins that cut across these uh, these Archean metasediments, and so we, what we what we know so far is that uh, big delta, the isotopic difference between sulfate and sulfide, is very similar in the present day water um, and these and these much older fractures. Again, uh, we don't have a handle on the ages of these waters, but we are collaborating with uh, Canadian researchers who are again attempting a variety of techniques, um, primarily noble gases to see if, if they can get some reliable, some reliable ages, at least for the most concentrated brines, and then develop some mixing models of, uh, of flushing of these brines with waters uh, from the surface. Right now, we just don't know. We do know that uh, from the chemistry of the waters that these, are, these saline components of the water are not formed by 
by enrichment by freezing recently. We, they are definitely old brines. They were formed as uh, hydrothermally or as very, very ancient evaporitic deposits, but they're, they were not uh, recent um, freezing enhanced saline bodies. Okay, we have a question from Ames Research Center. Yeah, hi, this is Dave DeMarais. Um, about extensions to Mars and the interesting question about methanogens versus uh, the sulfur cyclers and so forth. Uh, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most of your sites are in sort of continental terrains that are sort of more felsic, you know, granitic, silica rich. And of course, the uh, uranium concentration may be also related to that because, as you know, those, those types of crusts tend to be richer in uranium. As you move towards Mars, though, you're moving more towards a basaltic, uh, mafic type composition. Now, the good news is that the ferrous iron would give you more reducing potential within the rock. On the other hand, you know, the uranium story is, is TBD. Uh, have you thought at all about just how the bulk rock composition might be affecting your consideration of methanogens versus other groups of organisms? Well, we've, we've, we've thought quite a bit about this uh, problem of how, how much radiation is potentially on Mars given the, the difference both in its bulk rock type and in the apparent uh, overall concentration of radioactive materials. And the interesting thing is on Mars, um, the way in which the groundwater is forming and the very ancient age of the groundwater kind of works to our advantage even though there's, there's less maybe an order of magnitude left less radioactive uh, material, these, these brines are aging for long periods of time so that you, you actually have the possibility to, to build up over billions of years fairly significant oxidizing potential in those brines if you can move away and not back react the hydrogen. So um, that's, that's our one thought at the moment. I don't, I, again, I don't think it shuts this out as a process. But um, obviously, it's not, it's not going to operate at this, with the same kind of fluxes that you have in a, you know, a uraninite bearing ore body. But I still, I still think it's something we have to look at. And in our preliminary modeling, it's quite a substantial source um, of sulfate in the subsurface. Did you want to comment on the methanogens, TC? Yeah, yeah. So the uh, you know the Ventersdorp lavas in South Africa were actually mafic basalts to start with, and one of the reasons why we moved to High Lake was to get back into mafic volcanic terrain. And as Lisa Lisa alluded to, uh, when you do the calculations for radiolysis to Mars and drop it by an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude, the rates just drop by that factor essentially. Uh, but when you include or calculate uh, how much would be required to sustain uh, a microbial ecosystem, there's still plenty of energy there to, to do exactly that, particularly if you believe that this, you know, essentially the maintenance energy rate is lower on Mars because the temperatures are lower on Mars. Now, with respect to the methanogens, at least in South Africa, what appears to be going on there is that as you go deeper into the crust, um, the calcium carbonate levels begin to, or I should say the carbonate levels begin to diminish, and that's because the calcium concentrations in the brines are increased and the pH stays very, very elevated. So the DEIC sinks like a stack of logs. And that removes CO2 as the principal electron acceptor from the system, even though there's copious amounts of hydrogen available. That seems to be what is controlling um, the diminution of methanogens as you go deeper into the subsurface. We haven't done a similar type of analysis, however, for lupin mines, and I'm frankly a little bit puzzled still as to why we aren't seeing any archaea at lupin as yet, although you find archaea present in ice deposits. So I'm baffled by that. Okay, we have a question from Penn State. Hi, this is Hiroshi Omoto, Lisa, and TC. I enjoyed your presentation very much. Uh, my question concerns the origin and age of the sulfate bacteria in deep uh, mines in South Africa. Uh, I accept that the water itself is very old, 15 to 25 million years, but I'm not quite sure how you can date those microbes themselves, whether 
they were contaminated from the surface quite recently or they are transported from the surface water body 15-25 million years ago and brought by, uh, down by circulating meteoric water deep down and they survived all the 15-25 million years period. And do you have any constraints of the age of microbes? Do they have a different DNA sequence compared to the modern one in those areas? Just answer the question, Hiroshi. They do. <laughs> <laughs> you do? Yeah, they do. Oh, yeah. I mean, you characterize the water that's used in the mining process in terms of the diversity of organisms present there. Uh, they, they leave a very clear fingerprint. You see a distinctive set of iron oxidizing uh, proteobacteria as well as some of the other usual culprits that show up in, in drilling water, sphingomonas and a couple others. You don't find our organism present, the Desulfurutus, in any mining water whatsoever. Also, it's absent from any water that is shallower than one and a half kilometers as well. It's just showing up. It doesn't necessarily mean it isn't there. For instance, if we had used the technique that, that Mitch Sogan has been recently publishing as the basis of his rare biosphere, it could be that Desulfurutus might be up there in the shallower aquifers, but as a very, very, very tiny, undetectable constituent that we haven't seen yet. We can't preclude that. But all we do, do know is that it dominates the environment once you're below one and a half kilometers, and the ages of the water are over three million years. Does that answer so, your question? There's, there, there are other lines yeah, of evidence, yeah, yeah. for instance. If you look at the drill water itself, the helium gas ratios are quite radiogenically rich, and they don't show an isotopic. In fact, they're depleted in isotopic noble gases. It's kind of hard to imagine how a fracture zone is exposed to mine air or mine microbes without essentially depleting its noble gases and replacing it with an atmospheric noble gas composition. That's really our strongest line of evidence to suggest that the fracture zone waters have not been exposed to mining water. That's not to say that the waters don't have some constituents which might be contaminants that it picks up on the way out of the borehole, but um, the dominant organisms seem to be entrapped, literally entombed, within these fracture waters. Now, could it be older than 25 to 30 million years? That we have no constraint. That we cannot say. I think also, <laughs> as we mentioned, as we mentioned earlier, it, it, there's also this intriguing absence of the O2 tolerance genes. I mean, this organism appears to have been removed from um, regular contact with uh, at least uh, O2 for an extended period of time, such that it, it, it has completely lost those pathways. But they must have originated from the surface, right, and then transported down by the water? sulfate reducing bacteria rather than and then evolve with time uh, in deep subsurface environment or yeah I mean you can just say that but we don't know the wind you know they could be moving up and down on the crust for quite a long time but we have no constraint on that Good, good question, Hiroshi. I, I, I wish we did know the answer. I wish yeah, there was. Is there a way of uranium lead dating a bacterium? <laughs> that would be great, but we don't have that method. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have a question from. We have another question from. From the University of Arizona, we have a question, and then we'll go back. Presumably, you can ask a question. Okay, my question is that. Um, a lot of the uh, waters on Mars are likely highly enriched in CO2. Um, that's evidenced in part by a lot of the explosive, uh, explosive flooding that you've seen and by you know, all the volcanisms associated with the Tharsis Fault. And so the water chemistry is likely to be a lot different because it's just like where you expose CO2. I mean, it gets up to lithostatic sometimes, even for possibly even in the present day. 
That's my question. Okay, so the question is, are you, the question are, you, are you asking us to say whether we think that the water is high in CO2 on Mars or not? No, I'm saying... Or are you given, telling me that it is? <laughs> I'd say given the likelihood that it is, according to certain theories, how would that high of concentration of CO2 affect your um, hypotheses? I, I, I'm really sorry. I'm afraid. I'm afraid we're not understanding exactly what you're asking. If you know, if you're asking, would CO2 outcompete sulfate? Um, yeah, energetically, it, it it would be quite favorable. And I'm I'm sure if there are organisms there, they would take they would take advantage of CO2 as an electron acceptor. It would uh, it'd be it'd be uh, a freer lunch. Yeah, so it's a different chemistry than your comparison. That was the point. Okay, we I guess that means that you know that it's CO2 rich and the pH is low. Uh, it depends who you talk to, but a lot of theories say yes. If you have a lot of CO2 in the subsurface, especially given the past. Well, I think we'd also have to assume, though, that uh, these, these ancient, very slowly circulating groundwaters are likely to be quite stratified vertically in terms of their chemistry. And if most of the CO2 is, is in the atmosphere, then it's, it, and, and yet we see all this evidence of sulfate, then perhaps as you go down, it would become a sulfate-dominated system. I don't know, but that's just kind of a, kind of a guess. Well, the only input to groundwater that you have is water being forced down underneath the North Polar Cap. So, which, in any case, I'm satisfied. Thank you. We have a question from Goddard. Uh, yeah, it's Mike Muma here. Uh, I'm actually interested to uh, ask for your opinion on the maximum uh, viable... Uh, time span, that is the maximum time span over which uh, organisms might remain viable in a truly closed environment below the permafrost layer. And the, the driver here is uh, if we think of permafrost on Mars, uh, they might be inactive for a billion years or more, since there's little evidence of tectonic activity in recent times. Uh, and I wonder if you've thought much about how to extrapolate. Uh, 25,000-year-old communities in the Arctic uh, to maybe billion-year-old communities uh, on Mars. Right. Well, I think that's essentially what we're doing. If, if you characterize the environment well enough and you understand the major players and the processes, it makes the extrapolation, you can make that extrapolation with a little bit greater confidence from zero knowledge at all. So all we can say right now at this stage of the game is that there's there's nothing that suggests to us uh, that there's any showstopper. There's nothing that would prevent a um, subsurface microbial ecosystem that's separated from the surface by permafrost from surviving for billions of years because it will always have a source of energy from radiolysis as long as there's water present in the system yeah. beneath the permafrost. Yeah. That's the only answer that we can give at this stage. Well, presumably they're not totally closed because the, they are, if they are losing methane to the atmosphere, there's some clear exchange there. There must be some kind of permeability to pores in uh, crater walls or scarps, uh, uh, so there may well be some uh, back diffusion possible at other times, CO2 diffusing inwards, for example, and so forth. So uh, I don't know if you've thought about a kind of a breathing event, if you like, where there's gas exchange between this uh, subsurface community, subgrowth community, and the atmosphere itself or not. Would that change your well, picture well, in any way? We certainly have thought about mm -hmm. that, and I know you know a number of us at the workshop last week talked about needing to do some some active measurements and needing to look more carefully at how things like methane and hydrogen 
move in and out of these these ices in permafrost, both the the pure water ices and the various clathrates. It's a, it's a big unknown, and I, I think you're absolutely right. We we need to know if this is a, a nearly impermeable barrier or if 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 it's quite quite permeable selectively to various gases moving back and forth. Certainly, uh, and you know my answer to this already, uh, hydrogen will diffuse through ice, no problem yeah. at all. So if we see any signs of hydrogen coming out of the system, uh, hydrogen is being made by radiolysis, that's a given. Um, if, it's, if there's no hydrogen coming out at all, that's actually a good sign for us. It means that it's being consumed down there, hopefully to make methane. You mentioned that you do uh, collect the uh, effluent gases from your column, your core, uh, and do you then do mass spec analyses on those or uh, any other kind of... That's right. You do. And do you yes. see hydrogen? Yes. And what is the DOH ratio? That's a bad question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mean hydrogen? No, I don't think... We'll, I, 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 we'll have to leave that for Barbara. <laughs> It'll be a question as to whether or not there's enough hydrogen in those rock cores to give us an answer. Yeah. Okay. So, certainly there were very high concentrations of hydrogen in the groundwaters in South Africa. Right. And there's less hydrogen in the lupin mines. Right. But your pressures there are still fairly high under the lupin mine, for example? Yeah, uh, less. Uh, anyway. Yeah, quite a bit less. Oh, quite a bit less because the, pre the pressure is actually set at the base of the permafrost, and so we're only a few hundred meters below the base of the permafrost. Yeah. Right. Because it's in equilibrium, hydrost hydrostatic equilibrium there. So that's, that's exactly right. right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I remember your number of five bars, uh, driving pressure in the deep mines in South Africa. Maybe I'm remembering it incorrectly. Is that right? It can't possibly be right. It must be. No, no, about 20 megapascals. Oh. Yeah, you don't want to get in front of that. Really? That's right, yeah. <laughs> and so in open mines, presumably, they're, they're much less than that. Yeah, I guess they were about, what, 8 megapascals, I yeah. think. I would have to go look it up. Yeah. Okay, we have another question from Penn State. Hi, um, it was a wonderful talk. This is Irene Schneider. I had some brief communication over the email with you, Tulis, about um, I'm very interested in your results because it directly relates to my thesis. Um, I'm doing radiation environments on Mars surface and subsurface, so I I wanted to know, I'm not sure if I heard you well before, but I think you, you mentioned something like an order of magnitude less on Mars uh, in regards with your radiogenic output in the subsurface. And I wanted to know um, exactly if that's what you said or, or if so, why? Why do you have an order of magnitude less um, for, for Mars? I was just using the uranium thorium concentrations that have been reported for SNCC meteorites and the potassium concentration that has been reported by rovers. But that's relative to these uranium mines, right, which are not representative of average Earth, isn't Or, or is no, that... No, are you saying that's... No, 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 no. Oh, so no. Mars itself no. is depleted. No, no, I'm saying Mars itself is depleted with respect to uh, bulk continental crust, yeah. Okay. okay. So in other words, the concentrations, the concentrations that we see in South Africa of hydrogen is actually consistent with the bulk value. And, and, and in fact, when you look at the details of uranium chemistry, the uranium is high only in very, very thin layers in the right. bit and cells. But overall, it's actually depleted in uranium. Okay, so okay, so that's basically a safe estimate, right? For Mars, you just go an order of magnitude less in, in that kind of uh, that uh, assessment. Because I was taking basically the equivalent to Earth, but I wasn't sure if, if that was a safe estimate for Mars. So that's why I'm asking you. Right, I, I think I published something in the Astrobiology Journal last year that sort of gives you the numbers that I'm talking about. Thanks. <laughs>
And, and I, I, I think you'd find that the people looking at the differences in the tectonic styles for the two planets like, like numbers in that range, order of magnitude kind of difference. Okay, we're back here at NAI Central. Is everyone still there? Lisa and TC? We're here and we can hear you. Okay. Okay, we got dropped for a couple of minutes there. But uh, it carry on if the questions were still going. Is everyone still there? Lisa and TC? We, we are hearing funny echoes, though. So we, we may have hit a point of diminishing returns. It's kind of, you know, space-time causality loop or something here. Okay, I think Ames had one question. Um, if they don't, that was the last two questions, I believe. Okay, if uh, that's it, then I think we should once again thank Lisa and TC for a great talk. And thanks for summarizing all of your work in this area. It's really fascinating. We look forward to hearing the next installments. Thanks. It was, uh, it was good fun from this end. Thank you very much.